but I don't know something's going on. He goes, you recognize who that is? Saying that Trump is a suicide bomber. And I said, no, who is she? He goes, that's Michael Hastings' wife. And there's a reason to bring this back. Remember the guy that said, I found out the government's doing really horrible stuff. When it comes out, Obama's going down. He'd been a liberal. His car blows up going down the road. The engine shoots out like 100 and something yards. His wife tells Big she thought it was dirty pool at his funeral. Then she goes on CNN and says, oh, everything's wonderful. Oh, no, just the car was driving fast. He was running for his life when that happened. So let's play that clip and get Joe Big's take on it. Here she is. We're going to play the clip of uh, her uh, just coming out about Trump. Here it is existed or not it's a sad day when you cannot depend on the president's word and you know, my advice would just be to republicans who do cozy up to him it's just like hugging a suicide bomber he blows you up in the process with him it's like hugging us that's a little watch out i might have tapes bluffing comey into not lying and saying that the president tried to obstruct justice which comey says he didn't so and and you know here's the deal when Trump says there might be tapes, somebody might have tapes, but I didn't tape it. Trump has tapes. You're in the president's office. You better believe it was taped, just not by him. He's let everybody know, okay? He tapes everything, everything, everything. I've never taped anybody, but, I mean, Megyn Kelly was coming on so hard on the phone. I was like, this is the biggest hit piece on earth. And I said, uh, hold on one moment. I got the other phone. Started. I didn't, even, I didn't even have a record app on my phone to record phone calls. I guess they have those. I had to get another phone and record it that way. They're like, oh, you're being so immoral, taping her. She was coming on, man. You can hear it in, in what she said in the tape, how she's obsessed with me and wants to have dinner with me like I'm some idiot that like, even thinks she's attractive. Joe Biggs, you know the uh, wife, the widow, uh, and, of course, she was on the National Security Council herself as a top aide. Very, very interesting uh, to have her up there saying this. What do you make of it, Joe? I mean, it's disgusting. It's the same kind of rhetoric we see from the left day in and day out. I mean, you have Johnny Depp coming out, calling for an assassination of Trump. Um, you, you've got Kathy Griffin. It, it just fits this entire narrative. And and she's someone who used to work for Bush. You know, I, I'm, I was shocked more than anything. My buddy Josh Kaplan posted the video yesterday, and I just saw her, and I was immediately, I'm not going to lie, I was pretty triggered because I just don't, ever since what happened with the funeral and then how she turned her back on that, I've kind of been upset with her from the get-go. I just stopped talking to her. When I saw her face, I was like, God, I was like, I got to watch this. What's, what's going to happen? And when she goes, Trump is like a suicide bomber. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, this is the kind of rhetoric that leads to people being shot at. This is the type of stuff that fuels those basement dwellers who live at home with their mom and then finally come out of the shadows and try to pop off a few rounds at Republicans and have kill lists. That's adding to the fire. It's ridiculous. And they're running and the around saying hunt Republicans, and then they don't even apologize for it. Uh, what do you think their plan is, Joe? They want us to pop first. They want they want to provoke us to a point to where we pop off and we're the ones who draw first blood, and that's what they're trying to do. But they keep drawing blood. They've attacked us time and time again. I agree. The thing is, I, though, is left media never covers that. Back in 70 seconds, we'll finish up. Then Mike Cernovich is coming up. I want to ask Joe Big about the president being a suicide bomber. When just a month ago on the same network, their anti-terrorism expert said ISIS should hit Trump targets. It's like... You're actually on the news asking ISIS to coordinate attacks. I mean, and what's going to happen if somebody kills Trump? What's going to happen if somebody, or, or Johnny Depp, or CNN host saying, well, it's just political, he's not evil, shooting Congressman Scalise and the cops. What happens when somebody shoots them? Are they going to then say, oh, it's just political? Again, they want to play the victim, but they're the ones on the attack. Why haven't they staged big false flags? Like, I mean, what happens when a, a guy gets stabbed nine times coming out of a political rally in support of Donald Trump. You know, that's ridiculous. These guys are willing to take that extra step. They're willing to put blade in the flesh. They're willing to put bullets through flesh. And it's ridiculous. And he gets called, he gets called a, uh, a, a white nationalist. He gets called a racist because he's a white guy. Oh, yeah, and the media says punch a Nazi, stab a Nazi. So he's a white guy. He's a white nationalist. Now, major feminist groups are saying abort your baby if it's white. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, it, it, they no, white genocide's real, and it's being directed by liberal white people. I'm not giving yeah. the, the I'm not giving the minorities a pass here, but I used to hear people go, "Okay, white genocide, yeah, right." It's all over the news saying white should all be killed. What in the hell is going on? You have to look at people like Tariq Nasheed. This guy is on Twitter every day 
uh, just spewing out hateful messages. Anytime there's a white person involved with anything, he's automatically a Nazi. He's automatically this and that. And this guy has a huge following. He says that everyone that was involved with the anti-Sharia march were all closet racists. They were closet Islamophobes. And that's what the I'm not a closet Islamophobe. I'm very phobic of Islam. I don't want anywhere near Saudi Arabia or these places where women walk around in hoods. I'd have a panic attack walking around the street with a bunch of women with hoods over their heads and guys walking around wearing diapers and everything. I don't like it. Yeah, I don't want like a Teletubby. I don't want to look like a closed up umbrella walking through the streets. This stuff is crazy. And, and, and we're racist because we don't want what we're seeing happen in Europe coming over here. And, and it's already starting to happen here. I mean, we've already had the Orlando shooting. We've already had San Bernardino. We've already had Chattanooga. I mean, 9-11. I mean, time and time again, we've had so many things. And yet they just go, oh, well, it's okay, though. It's not all Muslims. Yeah, it's not all Muslims, but it's a 1.7 billion population. And only takes a small percentage of those guys to be bad and inflict harm on 10 times more than that. And it's already happening. Listen. If you want to get into Switzerland or Japan, you got to have a degree and some money in your ass. And they don't care if you're black. You don't care if you're Asian. They don't care. You better have your stuff squared away. Nobody brings in people from failed Muslim states like Somalia and Sudan and Syria. It's nutball. And I'm sure you've now seen where now the German Green Party wants to bring in whole villages and transplant them into German villages. Yeah, there's uh, 600,000 population of Shia Muslims in Germany alone. Those are the same kind of people that, that do the tot beer, where they every year they take blades and swords and smash them into their foreheads until they split their own heads open. They're going to split their own heads open. What makes you think they're not going to lob your head off? All I know is it's, it's, just, it's, a, it's, it's, it's total insane asylum behavior. And I just can't believe the left has gone so mentally ill. Where do you think this ends, Joe Biggs? I don't. I mean, it, it, it definitely ends with someone trying to take uh, an attempt on on President Trump's life. It, it it ends with someone doing something like that, trying to spark. Well, we've already seen the guy try to grab the gun from the cop and do that in other events. I, I mean, sure, but I mean, I, I think it ends with them attacking Trump supporters. This is really an attempt at bullying, just like Hitler bombing civilian centers in World War II in England. It had the opposite effect. He thought it would make the Brits give up. They actually got solidified because of that. There's actually a group of Antifa I found out yesterday that meet every Thursday at a public library in Austin, Texas, under the guise of a, a history uh, uh, class where they, they go in and they, they, they do homework or whatever. And Antifa is allowed to openly discuss what they're doing, their communism and their tactics to attack people, especially for the July 1st march that's going to be next Saturday at the Capitol. They're allowed to openly discuss that stuff in a public library without anything. It's ridiculous. But we go meet somewhere and we talk about how we're, we're Trump supporters, like the Portland State students, and they get shut down. They're harassed. That's they right. Joe Biggs, thank you. He's got to uh, let those develop a little bit. Things too fresh, you know, expose your sources. But look at this headline out of the New York Daily News. June 20th. This came out a few days ago. I just saw it. Celebrities, Alex Jones, and sexual abuse. Read the article. There's nothing about me and sexual abuse. They just say that. That's called fake news. Medium.com, at Cernovich, joining us. Uh, so much has happened. Wow, no one even cares about Megyn Kelly now. They admit lowest ratings ever. Uh, I can't believe it. I, even though they edited me like hell, you, you could have had a ham sandwich up against her. They would have declared me the victor. So that I don't get the credit. Our listeners, everybody get the credit. But we are going to be releasing uh, next week the audio. I just And when I say edited, we'll release raw clips. We'll say, here's what I said raw with a transcript. Then we'll say, here I said it at this minute, and 10 minutes later or 11 minutes later, said this, totally different subjects edited together. She did it. Despite the fact I warned her about Katie Couric, who got caught doing that and got sued over it, she still did it, Mike Cernovich. Their editor still did it. And Sean Hannity came out and said, release the full tape. He knows what Ted Koppel did to him. 70 seconds aired after a 50-minute interview. They entered me off and on for 12 hours, four hours straight. Five hours, probably. And it can, so it just shows how but we, Cernovich, we have them. We have them editing stuff together. We have them. Can you believe the arrogance? Well, CNN, according to the latest ad week, only did 750,000 total viewers. They're all on the decline. That's the whole point. They really are. They really are nobodies. They're on the decline. They're on the fall. They don't know what they're going to do. They're, de they're so desperate, actually that Jake Tapper, one of the biggest CIA shills and deep state shills, 
had to actually ask on Twitter, he goes to the DNC, why didn't you give your hard drive to the FBI? Even the fake news, fake taper at CNN is realizing, whoa, 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 the winds are blowing a different way. I better try to ask a, a real news question, a patriot question. Of course, the answer is there's child pornography on those DNC servers. You know, they're all, you know, God knows what kind of sick stuff they're doing there. That's why they never handed it over to the FBI, for sure. Now, I'm going to get out of here and give you your time, but I promise next month we're getting the new shows launched. You're going to be hosting every day. We're really excited about that. Have you told me the time yet you want to host? You want to host right after the show at what, 3 o'clock Central? Yeah, I'll probably do the fourth hour the way we're doing it now, just Monday through Friday, the, the current hour. But, I mean, there, there's so much going on. There's so much raw talent. There's so much energy and enthusiasm that – you know, there's so much there's so many people out there hungry for the truth and we can't we can't even meet the demand so we're going to have to figure out you know who else is going to be involved with this because uh, for example I was in Washington DC I'm, I'm out here I got some major stories but I can't I can't release them yet because then they'll be able to find out you know all, all my secret sources but I'm just sitting down enjoying a cigar with some friends and every 5 minutes Cernovich Cernovich, how are you? And, and again, like not bragging, like when I was with you in Austin, the whole restaurant stops and looks. It's, it's not bragging. It's just showing It shows the success of the liberty movement. Exactly. It shows the, the success. And, and, and that's the issue is when I was out with Megyn Kelly, I'm not bragging. More people said, there's Alex Jones. They weren't putting it. Many, and it's not that I want to be the big celebrity. Quite frankly, I wish I wasn't seen in public. I'm tired of it. But I see it as we're hurting the globalists. They're scared. They're coming after us. Since you mentioned that, I'm going to play Jay Johnson, not pleased DNA refused DHS help. Now Debbie Washerman Schultz has come out and said he's a liar. So the rats are turning on each other. Here it is. As to what was offered them, what they accepted, was there any level of cooperation at all? <clears throat> um, to my disappointment, not to my knowledge, sir. Um, and this is a question I asked repeatedly when I first learned of it. You know, what are we doing? Are we in there? Are we helping them discover the vulnerabilities? Because this was get into OPM and actually help them discover the bad actors and patch some of the exfiltrations or at least minimize some of the damage. And so I was anxious to know whether or not strike. You have an unprecedented uh, amount of cyber hacking by a foreign power, an adversary from my point of view. Uh, it was definitely a nonpartisan yeah, interest. That, yeah. um, and I, I recall very clearly that I was not pleased that the Democrats literally were naked, wide open. Hillary had her own server. She was putting stuff on there for sale. She knew it was compromised. She'd put the classified stuff on. She got it. That's, that's what their foundation is. It's like the Legion of Doom. Now, here's Debbie Washerman Schultz saying that Jay Johnson, their own Homeland Security head, is wrong in every respect. It's on record Homeland Security wanted to get in there. Here it is. Not out said that the DNC refused his department's help. You put out a statement afterward basically saying that Demonic Jake Johnson poodle. was wrong. Where is he wrong? He's wrong in every respect. Uh, <laughs> let me just, I contacted by the FBI, DHS, or any government agency, or alerted or made aware that they she talks like she's on painkillers. A, a an enemy state was in legal crap on it. All of you guys, and now it's the FBI's fault that they didn't protect you from the non-existent Russians. The Russians can hardly keep their lights on, man, after globalist. Mike Cernovich, I'm skipping this break so you have more time than I took. I appreciate you, buddy. Big stuff on D.C., but what do you make of the rats leaving the sinking ship? What do you make of them losing the fourth special election? And then their answer is just kill everybody. Well, the, the Russian narrative isn't working. Nancy Pelosi, of course, we want to keep her in power. She's wonderful. I, everything, if, if I could orchestrate and control what was happening there, I wouldn't change a thing. I'm very God, Let's replace her with Maxine Waters. Well, okay, that maybe that would be better. That would be the only way to improve it. The, I'm very happy with the way things are going. I'm very happy that their high-level staffers have been caught with child pornography, that Anthony Weiner's a pedophile, that the message is getting out. That we broke that. Yeah, that they're loaded with pedophiles. That's why they didn't want to give their server over there. I guarantee you there was child pornography on there. Jacob Schwartz or somebody had some, you know, kind of images of underage people. That's the real reason that they never gave it to the FBI. So people are realizing that the DNC is loaded with child molesters, pedophiles. Well, they all look like child molesters.
Exactly. And that's why they have no message for the American people. Why is it child molesters always look like child molesters? They never look like John Wayne. They never look like Donald Trump. They always look like child molesters. It's a great question. It's the physiognomy. You know, you look at the, the facial features of somebody and you can predict a lot of things about them. And there, there is a certain look to the, the pedophile look. And the, yeah, the they look like Dennis Hastert. The, the, the guy that shot Scalise from Illinois, he looks like a Den Dennis Hastert clone. I mean, he looks exactly. like a pedophile. Exactly. That's why he wanted to kill the Republicans to shut down investigations into pedophilia. He knew that the Democrats are his best bet. And uh, another guy looks like a pedophile who I think he was a Nebraska guy who said that he's glad the shooting happened. Yeah, that uh, that guy. There was another guy, a video today of a, a Democratic operative who said that. And of course, I'm not saying he is a pedophile, but I'm saying hey, doesn't Johnny just, Depp look like a pedophile. Oh, if you look at him, he, he definitely has that vibe. There's no question. There's no question he has the vibe. Oh, yeah. So the, the yeah, that's the shooter. You look at them there. They, they look like it. Right. And then there was a guy from Nebraska who was caught on an audio leaked audio where he said that he was glad that Scalise was shot. And then you look at him and he looks like Dennis Hasper, too. Well, so here's my next question. You're a smart guy. I talk to a lot of smart folks. We're holding back. We don't want to be violent. We're winning, you know, letting them shoot congressmen and stuff. We try to stop it. But they're clearly, the, the, the left's building up for a bigger tantrum, a bigger confrontation. How long do we take this, though, until Trump moves against them? I think, you know, the folks over at Brzezinski land on Morning Joe, they're saying, oh, watch out. Trump's about to become a dictator. No, he got elected. But if we have to move in a very serious way against people openly wanting to murder everybody, that's called your duty. I, I don't want to have a big shooting war. I don't want to have to, you know, arrest 10,000 of these people and have trials and hang their asses. But if it's done by a jury and we need to, I'll be there and pull the switch. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and, you know, you, you know, just call for, you know, stuff without actually being part of it. Uh, I mean, how long can they keep pushing for this? Well, this Sunday, the domestic terrorist group Antifa is going to actually have a riot in um, Washington, D.C., in front of the, the police station, I, I sent the uh, the producers a picture of some uh, graffiti that I found. So, yeah, this um, Sunday, June 25th, they're actually going to go start a riot against the D.C. police. So they're they're setting their own trap, man. The, the police aren't going to take too kindly to this plan, uh, to terrorist plan that they have. Well, I'm just getting sick of it. I mean, you know... <sighs> We have actual communists here in Austin marching around with guns with their fingers on the triggers. We have an open carry and our rivals are pointed at the ground. They're not loaded. We're exercising it to have the right. We're not out there. I mean, my reporters were there and I'm like, watch the video where these communists have their guns like this towards the cops and my reporters. And I mean, I'm sorry, I, I can't go to these because if a guy has a gun towards me, I'm going to attack him because that's an act of aggression. That's menacing me. Under state law, his ass needs to be arrested. So I'm yes. Mr. Anti-Police State when they're left as control. But if you're going to have dangerous, violent groups trying to start a civil war, it needs to be nipped in the bud now. This is racketeering under every federal and state law. The Democrats and all of them are a clear and present danger. And I can tell you, special operations, the Pentagon, you name it, still has moles in it from Obama. But in general, 90% are ready. If a civil war starts, there is a big Christmas list of these leftists. So I hope every one of them that wants violence and war knows this. I'm not going to... Talk about what people are planning in defense of this, but you just know this. This is a two-way street. Yeah, there. there's also an Antifa terrorist group in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and they have a gun club and all their message boards and their private WhatsApp groups and everything. They've said that they need to do more tactical training to kind of to murder people, essentially. And uh, the, so what I... That's right. Actually, they're very upset at the Huffington Post in their places. That, that, that the guy wasn't technically better. There weren't more dead. They, were, they all bemoaned that, the hunting, the Republicans. They said, too bad there wasn't more. We, you know, we'd mean more, more dead. Yeah, and, and one thing, this is probably the only thing keeping me alive. I was actually met by a very menacing, reptilian, uh, pedophile kind of person on one of my trips, and he came forward, and he wanted to give me a warning. So I, I handed him a slip of paper on it, and I'm not going to say what names were on it, but there were 10 names on it. And I said, just so you know, if anything happens to me, that's going to go all points bulletin that these are the 10 people that are going to be deemed responsible for my, my death and my murder. So you make sure that that gets up the food chain to the people that you're acting on your behalf for. And he freaked out. It looked like he was like a ghost hit him. And I said, yeah, if you think you're just going to kill me and have me disappear, know that these 10 people 
it's a dead man switch. I go, these 10 people are going to be held accountable for it. And you just make sure that they know if that's how you want to play and something happens to me. There are a lot of people who th that list will be made public. And then what happens after you murder me, I, I won't have any sympathy for Let's you. Let's get a little bit more into this because these people always think when they threaten you, it doesn't scare you. It freaks them out. And I'm not bragging, but I'm the next person threatens me, I'm punching him right in the throat. You know, I, I mean, so, so just, you're not a wimpy guy yourself. You're a big guy. So, like, uh, I mean, describe what this was like. Okay, so he was very, he had that kind of sunken in creepy face that we, you know, that we all know of, a little bit too polished, a little bit too smooth, uh, sunken in. He was uh, skinny and lanky with these long kind of features. Psychopaths, had, genetic traits. Yeah, yeah, the typical, like, you can look at that, and he had a sociopathic thing, and he came up, and he's, Michael Cernovich. And you you get chills down your neck when these people talk to you because you can feel their the energy or vibe, and I was like... Their commitment to evil. Yeah, I really was like, ugh. I was like, what is this? And he goes, so you've been very busy looking at things, haven't you? And I go, what, what are you talking about, man? He goes, you know that you're a little bit closer to some of these things than you should be. Some of these stories you're on, you we've let you go farther than you probably should be allowed to go. And I go, okay, so what are you saying? Because I'm a big put it on the table kind of guy. I'm like, what are you saying? He's like, well, there are a lot of people very disturbed by the things that you're looking into and that creepy little vibe. So then I just, I had a pen on me and I said, you know, hold on a second. I said, hold on a second. Woo. And he stood there and, you know, they're very still and cold. Uh, again, they don't even feel human. So Medicine. I had a little, yeah, so I took a pen out. And I had a little uh, scratch piece of paper, and I wrote down. And then you accidentally names. did this with the pen just in his throat? No, because I, I knew that they were going to murder No, I'm joking. Me. I'm joking. Go ahead. We yeah, would never no, do but, that. But, so what I did is I wrote 10 names on, and I said, these are the 10 people I want you to know that if I am murdered, these 10 people will be held responsible. And suddenly he looked at me, and then he did not like that. He gave me a look and scurried away. Because I don't know if he thought he was just going to um, scare me, but the names of the people that were on that list, those are the kind of got his attention. On their behalf. Uh, you're yeah. going to take over here. But let me add one more thing. We are talking about how we fund ourselves. Evil shampoo, evil toothpaste. Toothpaste is now overall the best seller. Your host, Mike Cernovich. This is a test. Welcome back. Mike Cernovich here. Apologize for the hair. It got rained on in D.C. I wasn't it expecting the weather so we gotta we gotta get this hair fixed up but that aside we have some cool things planned just so you know if you're in the washington dc area tonight we're hosting a we call them a maga meetup these are very important events to connect with other like-minded patriots we always have a great turnout there's a picture on my twitter of the kind of people who show up it's always a great time that is tonight friday at 7 p.m eastern standard time in Washington, D.C. at the Trump Hotel. Just come on out. We're all in the bar area. We just hang out. There's always, you know, 50 or 100 of us connecting. So, yeah, there's a picture from the last time. We always have a good time. Community is important because the fake news media wants you to feel isolated, and that's not even everybody who shows up. There's always way more people there, but not everybody wants to be in a picture. So the fake news media wants you to feel like you're isolated and alone, and we're everywhere. And that's, again, why I talk about being recognized in public. It isn't a brag or even that I care. It's just every time I'm recognized in public, that's a patriot right there. Every time somebody says, hey, Cernovich, I know right away, wow, there's another, even in D.C., at the swamp, we're in the swamp right now. Patriots everywhere you go tonight, there'll be patriots everywhere. And then Sunday at noon, we're hosting a rally a rally against political violence in front of the White House. I have heard that actually InfoWars may be live streaming the entire event. I don't have final confirmation on that, but we were, you know, all of Periscopes and YouTube Live and everything. And that is this coming Sunday at noon. It is a rally against political violence. Jack Posobiec will be there. Roger Stone is going to be there. Laura Loomer, who you saw from Shakespeare in the Park, Cassandra Fairbanks, Lucian Wintrins, Mike Flynn Jr., Ali, Anna Kate. Mike Cernovich, it's going to be a big event. We're going to have a lot of people. It is going to be a lot of fun. And that is this Sunday, June 25th, at noon in front of the White House. And you can find that information on the Facebook page or, you know, follow uh, twitter.com forward slash C-E-R-N-O-V-I-C-H all over there. Now, the reason, the reason we hold these events is because you feel alone because everywhere you're bombarded with 
violence in Hollywood, fake news. They make it seem like we're some kind of fringe movement. They make it seem like there are only few people. We're actually, I'm more, more mainstream than people in the mainstream. Alex is more mainstream than I am. There are patriots everywhere. So our job is to connect all of you. And there's also a hashtag, M-A-G-A-M-E-E-T-U-P-S, MAGA meetups. Not UPS like the store, it's more like ups. So MAGA meetups is a hashtag. So if you want to uh, start a local event or you want to meet like-minded patriots in whatever city, you can just go on Twitter and type in hashtag MAGA meetups, or you can follow the Twitter account at M-A-G-A-M-E-E-T-U-P-S. And you can, f so the important thing is we have to unite as patriots and we also, we have to network with each other, too. We all know everybody here, here's the official MAGA meetups page. You can follow M-A-G-A-M-E-E-T-U-P-S on Twitter because, you know, everybody listening to this knows that feeling that what if people find out I'm a patriot? If my job finds out I'm a patriot, I'm going to be fired. If people find out I'm a patriot, maybe they're going to be violent. Who knows what is going to happen? It's so important that we connect with other like-minded people in the real world, that's very, very important. And by the way, Alex has been very generous in um, helping sponsor these events, and that's why the InfoWarsStore.com is so crucial. Is a lot of people are like, oh, you know, if I go, we now are going to have Katie McHugh on, who she was actually recently fired from Breitbart over a tweet, which, based on what Breitbart writes and the articles that they write, a lot of people would think, well, wait, wait a minute, why was she fired? for tweeting out essentially what Breitbart talks about all the time, which is the link between um, radical Islam and terrorism. So if, if Katie's on the line, how you doing? How you doing, Mike? Doing great. Thank you for being able to make it today. Yeah, well, thank you for having me on. So for those of you who don't know, maybe briefly introduce yourself. Um, my name is Katie McHugh. I worked for Breitbart for about three years. I was a homepage editor, a radio producer, a reporter, um, copy editor, you know, sort of a jack of all trades. And I worked very closely with Steve Bannon, and that was an incredible experience. Um, however, the company has certainly changed since he left because he was, his personality was the driving force behind, you know, national, nationalist populist movement and Breitbart News itself. And you helped him with his XM radio show, right? Yes, he picked me um, uh, out of everyone on on the companies in the company, and uh, said it was a great honor. So it was so great to work for a boss who was, you know, total pedal to the metal. Um, everything he did was for the audience, for the callers, for our readers, um, and at the same time, we were totally ideologically aligned. So, what what is that like? A little bit. What is it like working with somebody like Steve Bannon? Steve is always on. I think he sleeps about two hours a night. So, um, you know, him and Trump both have that kind of extremely high energy uh, kind of lifestyle. You know, Trump himself sleeps about four hours a night. Um, Steve would get up at 2 a.m., work on show prep for four hours. Um, I would get up at 5 a.m., immediately mail him the show clock. And then he would do three hours of radio, um, and we'd book, you know, sometimes nine guests, sometimes ten. While well, at the same time, he's taking all these calls from people across the country. And then he would get on our 9 a.m. editorial call and then circle back with radio at 9, 9.30 in the morning. And so that's all before 10 a.m. <laughs> and some people haven't even woken up by then. So, and Steve, Steve is um, just absolutely brilliant, um, has so much vision, and he keeps his promises too. Because you can see in the White House, he still has that whiteboard up left of everything he wants to accomplish in uh, Trump's first term. And he keeps track of all these things and checks them off. So he has your back, he'll never betray you. And he was just a fabulous boss. So I'm glad that you mentioned that because it is fake news. The fake news narrative of Steve Bannon is he's some like schlubby guy who just lays around and, and hides out and doesn't really work. So you're, you're saying that that's completely fake news. That is absolutely fake news. Steve is the hardest working man I've ever met in my life. Um, and, you know, just because he's not in front of the camera all the time, um, you know, giving doing press briefings doesn't mean that he's just sitting around on his butt, you know, not helping to make America great again. That's totally false, totally fake news. Yeah, I'm so glad you say that because a lot of people don't appreciate, too, the how much work and preparation and everything goes in. You know, somebody like Alex Jones or somebody like Steve Bannon, you don't just show up and talk. You're, you have to be... You have to be addicted and it has to be kind of like your life passion or life purpose or you're you're going to burn out. And, and Steve definitely has always had that vision, hasn't he? 
Yes, he has. And, you know, his, the company was his life. And even just producing the radio show with him, you know, you have to be, you're up at five, you're working on the show, you're take, you're call, following up with callers who call into the show with news tips. You're thinking of the next guest for the next day while tracking the news cycle, trying to plan the flow for the show. Um, so, yeah, you have to be on all the time. And I just find all these descriptions in the fake news media, Steve is like some slovenly person, um, just despicable. They're very offensive. He's also a, an avid reader, isn't he? Yes, he is always reading. And like Trump, his you know his mind is plastic. He never stops learning, and he's always digesting new books. Um, and when I was producing the show with him, we were getting a constant inflow of new books. And um, you know, so my reading uh, expanded voraciously while working for him. So it, it, it's amazing because. While he's doing all this work, he still takes like an hour or so every day to read something new, learn something new. And I think that's a great model for all of us, um, you know, all of us patriots. That's something that, you know, that's a habit we should have. Yeah, and, and that's one story that has actually bothered me is that Steve Bannon is one of the few actual public intellectuals that we have. And conservative media never gave him his credit. They would talk about William F. Buckley or, you know, Rich Lowry is not an intellectual. He's not an interesting person. Nobody at National Review is doing anything interesting. But there, there was never a media narrative about Steve Bannon giving him the credit he deserves as uh, probably the, one of the most great right wing intellectuals of our time. Oh, I totally agree. And I think, you know, they're making the same mistake as Trump by trying to call him like unkept and lazy, you know, because Steve is you know, Steve's a genius um, and he is he's a predator. And so I think they're just drastically underestimating him and that's going to hurt them. I also think it's interesting, too, that I think Steve is the only person who's gotten in trouble and bad press for his reading list. I've never seen the press go after someone for uh, reading books that they didn't like. So, you know, they, they want to even censor that and make sure that, you know, patriots like us can't connect and can't even, you know, just share book ideas. Yeah, it was interesting that the media was triggered that he was reading a book called The Best and the Brightest, which is an ironic, ironically titled book because the people that we consider the best and the brightest during the Vietnam era, all the Harvard kids, Yale kids, Ivy Leaguers, they were actually the people who led us to this catastrophic failure in Vietnam. And we sort of have the same thing going on with the neocons and the Harvard kids, oh, we'll go to Iraq, we'll go to Afghanistan. The people that we view as the best and the brightest, the so-called elite they, they aren't elite at all, so the media was really triggered that he was reading a book because they view themselves as the best and the brightest, even though they're, they're not unique or interesting at all. I mean, you work in D.C. media. Is it true that they all kind of think alike and they're kind of boring to hang out with? Yeah, they are. And you can see this play out on Twitter, too, where all the little blue checks are retweeting each other, making snarky comments. You know, it's all just a game to them. Uh, Steve is a very serious person, which is why, you know, he's reading it. And I think that offends the media because they realize that they're being shown up by someone who works much harder than them, is much smarter than them. That's why they hate Alex, too, is they want to dismiss him as, you know, whatever. But he's always on, you know, he never stops thinking. So the, we need, you know, we need more positive attention to the virtues of these kind of public figures. And again, that's a story that has been coming upon us to tell. So you had mentioned Steve had a killer instinct. Now, here's what I've heard. And, and, and I'm going to I'm going to qualify this for all the drama mongers at home. I want Breitbart to succeed. I am happy Breitbart exists. I have linked to Breitbart and sent probably at least a million clicks to their site. I am not hating on or shading Breitbart. However, as a journalist, I will tell you what I have heard. I have heard that once Bannon left, Breitbart is now being run by lawyers. Yes, that's true. And many, and I want Breitbart to succeed as well. I want to go back to Andrew's vision, and I want to have Steve's energy. I really wish them all the best. However, I think that they're nervous about the intense media scrutiny on them, since Steve, of course, went to go work for Trump and his White House chief strategist. So they stopped following up on critical narratives that um, got big play under Steve. For example, that horrible gang rape of that little disabled girl in uh, Twin Falls, Idaho. Um, management did not want to touch stories like that because they are pretty radioactive and they are explosive. But this is what the people want, and this is something that a nationalist, populist-minded uh, group should discuss. We should ask about why are these third world refugees here? Why are they living in slums? Why are they giving cheap labor to you know different factories and while little girls are getting raped? Do we vote for this? Do we ask for this? Why don't communities have any control over that? And it's just surprising to me that Breitbart is shying away from that kind of critical discussion. Why, why do you think that is? I think because um, 
Well, in the case of the Chobani yogurt factory, which is located near Twin Falls, um, the person running it is of a Turkish descent. I think he's a citizen. He was naturalized. And he likes hiring a lot of these refugees on the cheap to keep producing his yogurt. However, a lot of these people are very litigious. And I just think Breitbart has, you know, a lot to worry about right now with their advertisers, things like that. And they don't want an expensive lawsuit, you know, to come crashing down their heads. I've also heard too, and it's just, and this is what I, the way I interpreted Breitbart as run by lawyers is as a lawyer myself and working with lawyers. If you want to be told why you can't do something, then ask a lawyer for advice. If you say, I want to start a media company, they'll give you 10 reasons why it's a bad idea. Lawyers are not visionaries. Lawyers are risk averse and they, you know, they, they focus on that 1% of the risk and say, well, you better not you better not take this shot because there's this downside risk that it maybe it was only 1%. So I interpreted Breitbart as run by lawyers to mean that they don't want to take big risks anymore. That's exactly right. And there's nothing wrong with that mindset, but that's dramatically different than what Steve did. You know, I, I can't see um, Breitbart with a kind of, you know, truly, like I said, killer instinct right now because they are concerned about so much risk. And the story, so what was like the assignment? Like, I know for a fact that they had a major story. I'm not going to, I'm not going to scoop them, but I know for a fact that they had a major story that would have sent, um, sent shockwaves. It's a national security story. It would have sent, sent shockwaves all through DC and they decided not to run it. Are, are big time stories getting killed inside Breitbart? Well, Breitbart had an approval process, and um, some stories would just inexplicably never get approved. They sit there for hours. Even simple things like I was trying to write up an FBI report, an internal report, not classified, that came out stating that the media is directly responsible for these executions of cops in the streets. You know, there's 50, 60 cops that were murdered, you know, in 2016, 2015. And a lot of these were um, from people who were ginned up by media reports on Ferguson, you know, uh, etc. And they would just go out and they would shoot a cop. Um, but Breitbart didn't want to touch that because it did have, you know, the FBI did talk about like the racial element of, you know, the, the black the black man getting shot by the white cop. Um, and they just decided, well, there's 1% chance that this could be a backlash on us, so we're just not going to run the story. So yes, they have killed a lot of stories. And one thing I encourage our listeners to do is go to Lee Stranahan's thepopulist.tv for some of the stories, especially on, you know, the SPLC, the Frankfurt School, the Twin Falls narrative that Breitbart killed. Yeah, and I'd also heard, too, that there was a meeting, and this is a direct quote that I got from one of my sources. Somebody at the meeting had said, we, we want to be more like the Hill. Uh, is that anything that you heard or culturally you felt was happening? Yes, absolutely. And, um, you know, there's a time and a place for that, but Breitbart's trying to be all things to all people, and it's not going to work. And, you know, is, you know, they want to be, they said publicly, we want to become the right wing version of the New York Times. Well, you're Breitbart. And I feel like they're trying to run away from the legacy and the reputation that gave them their success. And I think it's a mistake. And I, that's exactly why I told a lot of my friends at Breitbart, I said, you're not going to out hill the hill. You're not going to out politico politico. Your value proposition is that you're covering news and information that nobody else in the mainstream media is going to cover. That's your value proposition. That's what people go to your website for. That's what they expect. And if all they're going to get is another uh, saccharine basic talking point on the story of the day that they can find at the hill or the politico, then why go to Breitbart? Exactly. And um, becoming the right wing version of the Huffington Post, you know, that's you're not distinguishing yourself from the herd. And Breitbart should be pursuing these stories, um, these, you know, hot button stories that maybe other legacy media will touch and ridicule them for covering, too. We always get ridiculed for covering illegal alien crime, even though it's 100 percent preventable and it's something that people care about. So I, I really hope that they return to their old legacy. They realize that, you know, the direction they're going in is a mistake. And I just wish them all the success in the world. Well, I, I think I, I don't want to get my facts wrong, so correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't Ann Coulter have her column serialized at Breitbart and they cut out a link that she had included to a map of violence against Trump supporters? Yes, um, Ann's column on uh, how leftists want to kill us, which is frighteningly true, um, had a link to American Renaissance, which is a white advocacy group, uh, very famous, was founded in uh, 1990 segment with Katie McHugh. It's been a great conversation. We're talking about journalism, the future of media. Before we finish the segment off, I want to remind you tonight, 
the Trump Hotel, 7 p.m. Washington, D.C. We're having a MAGA meetup. Come on out. Follow the at M-A-G-A-M-E-E-T-U-P-S account, MAGA Meetups account. Connect with like-minded fellow patriots. We're everywhere. You're not alone. It's such a lie. I'm so tired of that being treated like some kind of fringe group, like we don't belong, like we're outcasts. We are the mainstream. We are the majority. We're taking back what is rightfully us. We're the good guys. We got to quit acting like we're in the shadows Oh, because these liberal media, these pedophiles threatening assassination. Seth Rogen's mocking a guy who was stabbed seven times in the chest, saying, oh, ha, 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 I hope that guy has health insurance. He doesn't, but I do. He's going to have to go fund me. They're, they're making fun of anybody who doesn't have the kind of money that they have. Johnny Depp advocating the assassination of President Trump. Madonna threatening to kill Trump. Kathy Griffin. All these pedophiles in the media, the pedophiles in the DNC, they won't hand over the server. They are the pedophiles. They are the people covering things up. They are the murderers. They are the psychopaths. They are the reptiles. So it is time for us to show up in public. We're not hiding anymore. We're not going to let the streets belong to these vile, disgusting, wicked, duplicitous, demonic people. Tonight, Trump Hotel, 7 p.m., host your own MAGA meetup. We're also having a protest, not a protest, a rally against political violence. We're going to do that in front of the White House, Washington, D.C., this Sunday at noon. I do believe InfoWars will be live streaming, but I will double check that. And so watch the live stream if you can't make it. If you're, if you're near D.C., come on out. I'll be there. Jack will be there. Roger Stone will be there. Cassandra, a lot of great people, a lot of fellow patriots are going to be there. Katie McHugh, what is the future of conservative media? Alex wants to do a massive expansion. He had told me, who is on your wish list of people? And I had mentioned a few names. I'm not going to go you know, over all of them. But I would say that I think Katie McHugh is one of like the greatest talents right now in media. So what is your advice for the future of right-wing media, conservative media, whatever, populist media, nationalist media, whatever it is that we want to call it? I would say absolutely be happy warriors and stay engaged with your audience. What you and Alex are sponsoring these MAGA meetups are so important because the media does try to make you feel ashamed, alone, atomized, cut off from everyone else. They do not want us to practice freedom of speech. They do not want us to practice freedom of assembly. Um, they want us scared and alone and separated from each other. So I think the future of conservative media will be bringing, re bringing readers together in physical space to get together and form a real movement. So what would that look like, brainstorming the idea? What would that look like? Well, I think these having spontaneous MAGA meetups across the country is a great idea because it all starts in the community. I think that all of us patriots should be rooted in leaders in our communities and um, be connected with each other across the country. So, you know, in your hometown, you can just say, all Trump supporters, let's get coffee on this morning, uh, you know, Sunday morning after church. And just, you know, keep keep building a community and keep making strong ties and don't let the media, you know, gaslight into think it gaslight you into thinking you're alone and there's something wrong with you. And also, we need more people doing YouTube's, Twitter, social yeah. media, even, you know, even if it's on knitting, we need all patriots to just kind of be out there and to unite. So I want to give you the last sort of 30 to 45 seconds. What is new in media? What is going on? What do the patriots listening need to do? I think that everyone should follow your model and uh, Jack Pistobiak's model of getting on Twitter, getting on Facebook and doing periscopes. We need to get in their faces, legally and lawfully. Yeah. More of that takeover. Right. <laughs> Thanks so much, Katie, for your time. It was a pleasure talking to you, and I hope to see you at one of these MAGA meetups one of these days. Well, thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate it.